Amen. All right, TMC family and friends, I invite you to open your copy of God's Word and join me this morning in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is our text for today. And follow along as I read, beginning in verse 9. 2 Timothy 4, verse 9. Be diligent to come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for the ministry. In Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus, Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus to Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me, may it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eublius greets you, as well as Prudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. For the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I pray now that you will bless as I preach your word. Father, I pray that you will take these truths and sink them down deep and seal them tight in our hearts and in our minds and in our soul. God, I believe based on the authority of your word that your truth can change lives. That people can be transformed today. That they can hear a message from your perfect and your holy word and their lives can be different. I believe today that those who are sitting on campus and those who are watching online, that many will be saved today. That they'll hear the gospel and they will respond in repentance and in faith. I also believe that many here today will be encouraged. I know that this time of year that many struggle with loneliness. They feel like they have been abandoned. They feel like they have been left out. They feel like family and friends have left their side. That world is marching on and they're left behind. And God, we want to bring truth from Your Word to shine that upon this predicament, upon this epidemic, God, to give hope, to give help. God, we also want to see clearly from Scripture how we can live our lives under the authority of Your will and Your Word. So God, right now, God, we invite the Holy Spirit to take my feeble words, my feeble studies, my feeble preaching, and use it now, God, for Your glory and for our good. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Church family, loneliness is a growing problem in our society. Some could even label it an epidemic. One study has shown that the most lonely group in America are college students. That may be a little surprising to you, but the list goes on and on. Divorced people, 
Those who are welfare recipients, single mothers and single fathers, household wives and elderly, and many, many more. The issue of loneliness is no respecter of persons. No matter what your age and stage in life may be, loneliness may be something that dogs you at every turn. Now we must remember that being lonely and being alone are different things. At times, being alone can be refreshing. Sometimes being alone is spiritually nutritious for us. We spend time with God and it is, it is a good and a holy thing, but it crosses over when loneliness creeps in and begins to uh, plague our hearts and our minds. Where we are longing for relationship. We're longing for the spouse that has passed away. We're longing for the connections that we desire and they are just not there. And in this time of year, during the holidays, it can be magnified to a greater depth. As we look around and we see the, the fun and the festivities that are taking place around us, it's easy for us to say, why have I not been invited? Why do I not have that kind of excitement around me? How come I'm not being brought to the parties and why are not people seeking me out? Why do I feel so lonely? To illustrate this principle, Charles Swindoll once told the story about a Kansas newspaper. The ad read this. The person who put the ad in the paper said, I will listen to you to talk for 30 minutes without any comment for $5. Kind of sounds like a hoax, doesn't it? But the person was serious and you would think that nobody would call in, but you would be wrong. This says that uh, within just a matter of days, this man was receiving 20 to 25 calls a day. For people to call a complete stranger just to be able to talk without comment on the other end, just to feel that kind of connection with another human being. I've also heard a research about a man who would go to get his hair cut on a weekly basis. Of course, his hair would not have grown out to the point to need a haircut every week. But when he was asked why he did so, he said, this is the only human interaction and the only human touch I get in my life. Friends, it ought not to be that way. We as the body of Christ must be able to be the true hands and the feet and the mouth of Jesus. We are to look for those who are the loneliest and those who are the left out. We're to seek out those who are hurting and those who are alone and bring a message of friendship from God Himself. Amen? Amen. I can assure you in your families, in your neighborhoods, the places of your employment, there are people who are struggling with loneliness. There are people within this church right now that are struggling with loneliness. Maybe you'll be the answer to their prayer. Maybe God wants to use your and your kindness, your time and your energy to befriend those who are struggling in loneliness. And you may not be able to show Jesus in any clearer way than that. Or on the flip side, you may be the one here today that has felt the weight of that pain. I want you to know that first of all and most of all that you are not alone. That God has promises in Scripture that He is here for you, that He is not against you. That the world may have abandoned you, but God has not abandoned you. When everybody else in your friend circle has walked out, Jesus walks in. Amen? Amen? But God also is asking you to take the step of faith, if you are lonely, to reach out and to build friends. To do your part to engage with others and not stay stuck in that loneliness. With loneliness comes the feeling of being left out but even more so becomes this sense of worthlessness. 
We begin to tell ourselves, if nobody wants to be with me, I guess I am not worth being with. Friends, I want you to hear from Scripture today that's a lie from the pit of hell and it smells like smoke. Amen? That you are worth being with because the God of the universe wants to be with you. The body of Christ, other believers, wants to be with you. No one should suffer in silence. Albert Einstein, the great scientist and mathematician, once said this, It is strange to be known so universally and yet to be so lonely. Janis Joplin, I heard this week, who was one of the biggest rock stars of her time, just a week or so before she overdosed on drugs, made the statement, once I step off of the stage, I have nothing to do but to watch TV. Her life had become empty. It had become all a show, all a performance, all of the fans and the accolades, but her relationships had withered up and died. She knew that she was not fully known and fully loved by God or by anybody else. And because of that desperation sank in, she turned to drugs and eventually it took her life. John Milton, the great poet, noted that loneliness is the first thing that caught the eye of God as not being good. That God spoke and created everything out of nothing. The first chapters of Genesis says that the power of God's Word and of His creative mind spoke and there it was. And after each day of creation, God said, it is good, it is good, it is good. But the first time we hear God saying that something is not good is in Genesis 2.18, where He says, it is not good for man to be alone. That when God looked at man, He said it was not good for man to be alone. Now this man had all the world at his fingertips. He had all the animals that he was able to give a name to, meaning he had authority over them. But God said for that man to be alone, it was not good. And that truth has not changed over time. That when God looks at our humanity, He says, I created you for community. I did not create you to be a lone ranger. I created you to be known and loved by other human beings under the authority, the grace, and the mercy of God. Was well, I read this passage of Scripture in 2 Timothy 4, I hope you felt the weight of Paul's words. It almost felt like loneliness was dripping from his pen. That Paul was now closing in to the end of his life. 2 Timothy is Paul's swan song. This is the final words that we have from the great apostle penned before he gave his life for his faith. He was in that dungeon waiting for Nero to give the final orders to have him decapitated. And as he was waiting, waiting he was redeeming the time, writing these final words to Timothy to give him encouragement, to give him instruction. But here in this last part of the last chapter of 2 Timothy, we see Paul laying his heart bare. He shares the loneliness and the pain that he was dealing with. We must remember that Paul was not a super Christian, that he was just a man like us, called by God for a unique task, but he did not, he was not impervious to the loneliness, to the pain, and to the fear. Paul was honest about that. He spoke many times about uh, how he came in his fear and trembling and trepidation. That Paul walked in courage, yes, but courage wasn't the absence of fear, the absence of loneliness, the absence of pain. It was the willingness to press through it. Paul's an example to us today. 
to be honest with our brokenness, to be honest with our loneliness, but turn to the things that God reveals to us in this Scripture for the hope and the help that we need. So in your outline, in your bulletin, number one, during times of loneliness, seek support. During times of loneliness, seek support. Follow Paul's examples. Look in verse 9. Be diligent to come to me quickly. Again, Paul was talking to Timothy. Timothy was in Ephesus, a church that Paul had planted and was near and dear to his heart. But Paul knew as he got close to the end of his life, he wanted Timothy to get to him because he wanted to be physically in the presence of his son in the faith. Now, we do not know if Timothy made it to Paul in time. We do not know if Timothy was able to make the day's long trek from Ephesus to Rome to be with his mentor before Nero gave that final decree for Paul to be killed. I hope that he did. I hope that Paul got to see one of his very best friends I hope that Timothy was able to come and to give a word of comfort to wrap his arms around his friend and support him. It's kind of a reminder to us that whenever someone is struggling, whether it be with loneliness or with grief or whatever life may throw their way, sometimes our presence is the greatest gift that we can give them. That there was nothing that Timothy was going to be able to do to fix this for Paul. That Timothy wasn't going to be able to get Paul out of jail. That Timothy wasn't going to be able to stop his execution. That Timothy would not be able to fix all the problems that Paul was facing. But Paul wasn't expecting Timothy to do that. He was just expecting that Timothy come with his presence and with his love. Because that can often be the greatest gift that you can give anybody. It's the gift of your time, the gift of your attention. And we teach here as part of our daily missional strategies, the gift of listening. You simply give somebody your ear and you listen and you care. Friends, you are going to reflect Jesus to them and bring help in times of great need. But Paul said, don't waste any time. Be diligent. Be intentional. Get here quickly. My days are drawing to an end. Verse 10, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Now we're going to revisit this very same passage next week, next Sunday. So make plans to be here. We're going to talk about Demas. We're going to talk about Mark. We're going to talk about Luke. We'll take some of these uh, characters in this passage and unpack their lives a little bit more and learn much from that. But we see the loneliness attached because Demas was a friend, but then he abandoned. You have sensed that pain before. You know what it's like when the going has gotten tough in your life. You had somebody that you were counting on, someone that you were banking on being there, and they have abandoned you for the love of another. There's probably no greater pain in life than whenever you've experienced that from a spouse. Somebody that you married and you said, until death do us part. That we are committed in a covenant between God and us and family and friends, but yet they have left you in your time of greatest need. I am ministering to a couple right now where the, one of the couples is going through a very difficult time. There was a time of needing to get some medical and, and mental health care during a time of greatest need. The other person in the relationship has jumped ship. Has left the person to deal with the problems alone. Friends, we are to stick together through thick and thin. We are as marriages to be an example to the world of what a commitment looks like. The body of Christ is supposed to stick with one another whenever hard times face not abandoning one another. 
Friends, the Bible say, are to stick together. One of the greatest examples of friends in the Bible in the Old Testament is uh, David and Jonathan. That David was being hunted and pursued by Saul, Jonathan's dad. But Jonathan said, David, you are my friend and I will not forsake you. I will not abandon you. Can you have that kind of tenacious friendship? Whenever you have a friend that's going through the hard time, the difficult time, when everybody else has walked out, can you walk in and say, I'm going to stand beside you? Read a story and study for this whenever Bill Clinton was going through his time of, uh, of, uh, of lying and committing sin and bringing reproach upon the position of presidency. There's no excuse for the things that were happening. Not only the original transgression, but then the the attempting to lie afterwards. There's no justification for that. But during that time, everybody was turning their back on President Clinton. Times have changed, have they not? Now those kind of things get celebrated. But back when Bill Clinton was president, there was actually some moral compass. And people were saying, that's wrong. You hold the position of president. There should be a dignity attached to that position in your personal life, in your professional life. Cannot be separated. And so some people were turning their back on him and they were at a banquet one time and no one would sit at the table of Bill Clinton except for Billy Graham. Billy Graham said, Bill is my friend. I will not turn my back on him. I will not celebrate. I will not justify the actions. These break the will of God. They break the word of God. They are a transgression that needs repentance. But he is still my friend. Can we have that kind of rock ribbed commitment? We don't have to celebrate in the sin that people are committing, but we've got to love the sinner as Christ loves the sinner. We've got to stop turning our back, stop walking away, but lean in to those who need us the most. Well, Demas left Paul when Paul needed him the most. Crescens for Galatia. Titus for Dalmatia. Now these two, most theologians say, was a negative leaving, as Demas was, but simply ministry and responsibilities called them to Galatia and Dalmatia. So sometimes people leave for even good reasons, but it doesn't mean that our pain inside, our loneliness, isn't very real. Titus was the same Titus that we're going to read about in our next study after 2 Timothy in the book of Titus. It says he left for Dalmatia. I assume there's probably 101 Christians there. (laughs) Only Luke is with me. Thank God for Dr. Luke. Amen. Dr. Luke was a professional medical... uh, He was a doctor. Yet at some point in time, his love for God, his commitment to Paul was so great that he left his practice, no doubt. He left his, all of his training and experience as a medical provider to say, it is worth following you, Paul, because the mission is big enough to give my life to. And Paul and Luke become a strong team. As you read the book of Acts, you see that Luke being the human writer, but halfway through goes from talking about all things that Paul did to the things that we were doing together. All the way up until Paul's final day, through all the persecution. Even during this time in prison, I don't know if Luke was chained up beside him or he just came every day to spend time with and to minister to Paul, but he was a loyal friend. We'll talk more about Luke next week. Get Mark and bring him with you. Remember Mark? How on that first missionary journey, how he abandoned the missionary efforts How he turned tail and ran home to mama. And then you had Paul and Barnabas had a dispute about John Mark. 
Again, you hold on to those thoughts. We're going to talk about that next week in a sermon called The Tale of Three Men. For he is useful for me for the ministry. I love that reconciliation. That God reconciled these friends. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. So we see here that Paul is calling for support. He's saying, Timothy, I need you to come to me. Throughout Paul's letters, throughout the book of Acts, there are about a hundred different names listed as part of Paul's circle of friends and influence. Within this last section of 2 Timothy 4, there's 17 names, including Timothy. It reminds us that Paul knew that his ministry wasn't just his ministry. It was a team effort. That Paul knew that he could not be successful in what God had called him to do without doing it with teamwork. You've heard the saying before that if you ever see a turtle on the top of a fence post, one thing you can know for sure is a turtle did not get there by himself. Amen? None of us accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in life by ourselves. That we are dependent upon God and interdependent upon one another to live out the godly life, the useful life that God calls for us to live. We talk about the mission church helping you find your why. To know God and to make Him known through five purposes that God has given every Christian. Worship. You can worship alone, but boy, it's much more powerful to worship as a body of believers. Amen? God, here's our worship. You're singing Caleb in your car, turning your dashboard into an altar. Praise God. Hallelujah. It's even better when you come together and worship with your church family. If you've ever had the opportunity to go to some kind of big rally or a big conference or a big concert and worship with hundreds or thousands of people singing Amazing Grace, boy, it is a beautiful thing, honoring to God and edifying to us. We also are to grow in our faith through discipleship. God uses three things to disciple us. The Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the people of God. That you have to have other people of God speaking into your life, supporting you, encouraging you, holding you accountable, and dare I say, even saying, hey, I see a problem here. Hey, I see something here that you might need to think about. Instead of us getting mad about that, we say thank you for that gift. You're being used by God to help me see the blind spots in my life. I tell people some of us have bald spots like me, but all of us have blind spots and we need other Christians to speak into our life. We must also take part in, in knowing God and making them through ministry. You can do ministry yourself, but it's so much more powerful when you do it with a team. Amen? That we serve God together shows a great uh, blessing from God to the world. But we also must grow through our fellowship. What is fellowship? Two fellows in one ship. Amen? Amen? <laughs> Being together, spending life together, doing the term is doing life together. Church is more than just sitting in rows and listening. It is more than coming to watch a performance. Church is about doing life together as the believers in Christ. That's why we have our mission groups on Wednesday. That's why you're encouraged to build relationships with other believers and spend time together praying and talking about the Word. That's why you're to find other believers at work, even if there's just two of you. You rally together for the glory of God and see yourselves as the missionaries on that place of employment, on that campus, wherever you are. Say, I'm ready to charge out with a squirt gun. God plus one is a majority. Amen? Do what God's called you to do, but it's good to do it together. Paul understood that principle. He could not complete his task alone that God had gave him. He needed friends, not only through his ministry, but here in his 
final days. This clearly echoes the actions of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to earth 2,000 years ago. He lived about 33 and a half years. The last three and a half years are His public ministry. And of those three and a half years, we get a little bit of the, the beginning, the virgin birth, and a little bit of the beginning, but really it doesn't happen. The focus of the Gospels is on His last week of life, the Passion Week, leading up to His sacrificial death on the cross. And as we see that cross looming even closer and closer, we see Jesus calling for His friends. In John chapter 13, we see that Last Supper where He brings His closest friends, the twelve together. One He knows will eventually betray Him, but He brings His closest friends together because He wants to spend time with them. Then He demonstrates the greatest act of servanthood when He bows, the King of the universe bows to wash their dirty feet. But the key was he wanted to be with his friends. Then we also know that shortly after that, he took Peter, James, and John, his closest inside of his group of friends, his very closest friends, and took them into that garden of prayer and said, pray with me. I'm entering into the most difficult season of my life. It was so painful that when Jesus prayed, sweat became blood as the capillaries broke with the anguish and the anxiety that was coursing through his body. And he did not want to face it alone. He wanted his friends there. But what did his friends do? They fell asleep. Jesus said, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. He wanted his friends there. He wanted his friends to pray for them. In addition to spending time with those who are lonely and listening to them, probably the greatest gift you can give is praying for those who are in pain. That you can pray for your friends, those who are lonely, those who are left out, those who are grieving, those who have physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual pain, that they become dependent upon knowing that you are praying for them. Let's follow the example of Paul. Let's follow the example of Jesus. And when during times of loneliness, seek support. The Old Testament says in Ecclesiastes 4, Solomon said this, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. Woe to him who's alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Who can you call upon during your time of loneliness and trouble? When you are stumbling or when you have fallen, who is the person that you can call to? Certainly you can call out to God, but God wants you to have some Jesus with skin on. Some human beings that love Jesus that you can call out to that your circle of friends and prayer partners. Do you have that? If not, you need to build that. We are unable to face this life on our own. It is too hard. It is too difficult. It is too painful. It is too lonely. James 5.16 says, Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed not just physically but relationally and spiritually and emotionally because the effective fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much now you may say well I tried I tried to build some friends I tried to call out and all I've been happened to me is I've been hurt gossiped about, criticized, ridiculed, judged. Well, friends, I understand. But choose to risk. Choose to get hurt. Choose to let people into your life and into your heart. Love them and allow them to love you back. 
It is easy to put a guard up to keep people at arm's length. But my friends, I can tell you, that's no way to live life because you're going to need people and people need you. Number two, during times of loneliness, seek Scripture. During times of loneliness, seek, uh, seek Scripture. Verse 13 says this, Bring the cloak, which is basically a poncho, an outer garment, a coat. Remember, Paul is in a dark and damp dungeon. Winter was approaching. He probably had just rags on. Just a practical need. Bring a coat to me. He goes on to say that I left with Carpus at Troas when you come. And the books especially the parchments. Since these items were expensive, in that day and time, people did not have a closet full of coats. I know in our home we got more coats and more blankets than you can shake a stick at. We're cleaning out some of those, trying to give some to the school and looking to find ways to use those wisely. You probably do the same, but here in that day and time, if you had one coat, you were almost rich. That this was a valuable thing that probably somebody made for Paul or gifted to Paul. It was important to him. The books, the parchments, they were something that was valuable to Paul. And because these things were so expensive and he had left them in Troas, many Bible scholars think that was probably where Paul was arrested from. That he would not have willingly departed with these few earthly items that he had when he was arrested and incarcerated. It was probably taken by force. That he left behind these valuable things not by choice, but by compulsion. Makes me think about how Paul no doubt felt. Reminded him about the early part of his life before his conversion. Remember before the Damascus Road, Paul was a persecutor of the church. The Bible says that he would have arrest warrants in all through Jerusalem and the surrounding hamlets and communities that he would bust down the doors and he would take the mothers, the fathers, the men, the women, and he would arrest them and put them into their form of jail, which eventually led to their death, no doubt the loss of their property, and left no doubt many children orphaned. Paul never forgot about who he was before Christ saved him. Paul never forgot about the sinner he was before the gospel captivated him. And when Paul was being arrested here and taken by force and handcuffed and thrown in a paddy wagon and zipped up to Rome, he left behind the few things that were valuable to him. This coat, these books, but especially the friends. You may say, well, what are these books and what are these parchments? We don't know exactly for sure. But many believe these represent and very well could have been the parchments being the Old Testament manuscripts that Paul had available to him. And these books or other translations say scrolls could be the Gospels. The beginning of the New Testament. So Paul was a scholar to the end of his life. That Paul planned to read the Bible, to study the Bible to his very last breath in life. Not only did he call for support to come help him in his time of need, he also called for the Scripture. Charles Spurgeon used this passage to rebuke pastors who preached but neglected study. He said Paul was inspired by God Yet he wanted the books. He preached for more than 30 years by this point in time. Yet he still wanted the books. He had been with the Lord. Yet he still wanted books. He had written major portions and parts of the New Testament. Yet he still wanted books. Friends, we never outgrow God's Word. 
The Old Testament, the New Testament should be valuable to us. The Bible is a treasure of timely and timeless truths that you will need for your life to your very last day. Friends, your study of God's Word is not like an academic pursuit where you finish the end, you take the final exam, and you say, I've done that, I've finished that, I'm moving on to the next thing. Friends, no, you need God's Word all through your life to the very end, but there's something extra special when you're going through a difficult time and whenever God's Word becomes alive inside of you, it becomes a very strong sense of support from God Himself. Amen. Just yesterday, I preached a message. Many of you know Betsy Bradshaw. She passed away later, body to rest yesterday. And almost every funeral that I preach, most of them, when I stand, I say, "There's the words that I have to say will fall short. The words you share with one another, though they're valuable and meaningful, Share memories, share hugs, share tears, share words of support. But friends, our words always fall short. The only words that can bring the true help and hope that people need is the unchangeable Word of God. Amen. People need to hear a message of thus says the Lord. Friends, there's been times in my life where I've been beat down, I've been broken, I've been lonely, I've been scared, I've been angry, I've been overwhelmed. People try to help. I call for my friends. My wife has a good sense of support. i got good brothers in Christ here at the church. i got friends outside the church. I see a Christian counselor on times throughout my life. Every pastor needs at least two or three counselors. Amen. <laughs> but friends, all those words will fall a little bit short. It's only God's Word. They can really meet the deepest need of my life. Only God's Word can meet the greatest, deepest need of your life as well. Psalm 1 says this, Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel, who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the path of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season. Friends, if you're lonely today, if you're afraid today, if you are in pain today, physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, you need more of God's Word, not less of it. You need to listen to the Word of God. If you can't read it yourself, have someone else read it to you. Get on YouTube. Listen to a podcast. Listen to Bible on tape. Turn on a Christian radio station. Listen to the Word of God. Friends, nothing will give you greater peace and greater hope than that. Let me ask you a question, church family. If you were stranded on a deserted island today, there was no Wi-Fi, there were no libraries, you had no access to your Bible, how much of Scripture would you have stored up in your heart and in your mind? Do you spend so much time with God's Word that you can think God's thoughts after Him? Have you read the Bible? Have you studied the Bible? Do you meditate on the Bible? Do you memorize Scripture? For this is your greatest defense against the hardness of life. It's your greatest victory over the pain that you will experience. Paul, last thing we see from this portion is that Paul gave up everything to serve Jesus. These were the three things that were left. Physically, in addition to the friendships that he's focused more upon, but Paul said, I'm willing to give up all earthly treasures for the glory of God. Now, God may not expect you and me to give up everything we have and go on a mission field across the world, but you know what? As a Christian, you have to be willing to do that if God called you. You have to live with such an open hand. You say, God, my house, my car, my career... Got my bank account, my retirement portfolio. If you want it, God, I will give it to you. Now, he 
probably isn't going to say that he wants you to give up all those things, but he might. If he knows that's the idol in your life, just as he did to the rich young ruler in the Bible, and he walked away from Jesus. Having things is not a sin as long as those things don't have us. Amen? But whatever we do have, we use for the purposes of God. To serve God. Remember, nothing physically we have when we take to heaven with us. Amen? Everything we have gets left behind once we graduate and go to be with the Lord. So we can't take it with us, but we can send it ahead of us. Use it wisely now. Quickly, number three, during times of loneliness, seek the Savior. Seek the Savior. Verse 14 through 21 says this. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. And we're going to probably talk about Alexander next week a little bit too. But Paul was not going to retaliate. As Romans 12 says, vengeance belongs to God. It's our job. Even when people hurt us or harm us, the Bible says for us to turn our other cheek. To be forgiving. To show Christ just as Jesus did on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Let God do the reconciling of the books. Let God bring the conviction and the consequences on folks. Our job is not to control other people. Our job is to be obedient to God. Amen? May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our work. So he's saying, hey, Timothy, when you're making your way this direction, apparently he's going to be passing through maybe the general area where Alexander the coppersmith was. And Paul said, just be aware. I'm not going to retaliate against Alexander. He's done me much harm. I'm not going to try to go out and put a hit warrant out on him. I'm not going to try to ridicule him, but I am going to say his fruit reveals his root. He's got a problem. Be careful. Be wise. Be discerning. Most Bible scholars that I read on this said that Alexander was probably the person who ratted Paul out. Was probably the one who told the authorities where Paul was. Because of Alexander giving the tip, Paul was arrested. So Paul would have had the right to have animosity towards Alexander. Well, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for that guy, I'd still be preaching. If it wasn't for that turkey, I'd still be able to be a free man. God knows my need. He did me wrong, but it's not my job to retaliate. But Timothy, be aware. Don't allow him to pull the same trick on you that he did on me. At my first offense, no one stood with me. But all forsook me. And there's that loneliness just dripping from the pen of Paul. May it not be charged against them. And there's Jesus in the heart of Paul. Only Jesus could allow somebody to have this kind of a pain in their life and be wrong this way. Just as Jesus was able to say on that cross, forgive them, they know not what they do. The only way we can do that to the people that hurt us, to the parent that hurt us, to the spouse that hurt us, to the friend that hurt us, to the boss that hurt us, to the pastor that hurt us, the only way we can say forgive them is because Christ working in us. We can only forgive others because we have first experienced the forgiveness of God in our lives. <laughs> Nobody could hurt us or harm us the way that our sin has hurt and harmed our Savior. But the Lord stood with me, the faithfulness of God, and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. We know that the Bible says in Peter that the devil is like a roaring lion. That Paul had faced the devil head on and said, the Lord has protected me. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work preserved for me for His heavenly kingdom. Paul knew that he wasn't going to be protected from this imprisonment. He knew his time was drawing to an end. But Paul also knew that though his life was coming to an end, eternity was waiting him. We learned this just recently. Paul's motto on life was, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. 
He knew that crown of righteousness was waiting for him. That he had about ready to finish his race. That he had finished the course. That he had kept the faith. And it was now time for him to graduate to his reward. He could take hope and comfort in that. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. You remember those partners in ministry. Everywhere you see Aquila and Priscilla, they have a, a house church going on. They were a ministering husband and wife team and the household were Nisarus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Melita sick. I debated upon preaching a message on this. Don't know if I will three weeks from now or not. But we hear a lot today about kind of faith healing ministries and we see in Scripture the ability that that God heals people, still heals people today. But here you see an example that Paul, being the apostle, at one point in time, his handkerchief could heal people. <laughs> God used a handkerchief from Paul to heal people. Here he left a close friend sick. And Malik, it's not always God's will that we get healed physically. Sometimes we get sick and sometimes we die. Christians get cancer. Christians have heart issues. Christians have diabetes. Christians face the same struggles, the same diseases that unbelievers face, but we can face them differently. We face them with hope and courage and belief that life is more than a few fleeting years we have, that heaven is waiting for us, and that Jesus has a plan even in our pain. Right. Do your utmost to come before winter. Eublius greet you, as well as Prudence, Linus, that's probably the guy on Snoopy's friend. Claudia and all the brethren. So here, during a time of loneliness, Paul was seeking the Savior. God uses our loneliness, these seasons, to help us build a deeper friendship with Him. Friends, when we realize that God is all we have, it's when we truly realize that God's all we need. It's good to have friends. We should call for our friends. We should develop those friendships, but know that true friends are not found in times of prosperity, but the times of adversity. We learn that from the prodigal son. Remember when he went to the far country for righteous living? As long as the money was flowing, the good times were happening, he had plenty of friends, but as soon as the money dried up, he found himself alone in a pig pen. And he finally had to come to himself and went back to his father. Friends can be fickle. Friends can be fair weather. We need friends that are faithful. And the Bible says this in Proverbs 18.24. A man that has friends must show himself friendly. So when someone says, I don't have any friends, I just counseled a man last Sunday right here in our church, feeling lonely, felt isolated. He said the only way to have friends is to show yourself friendly. Right. You have to go and initiate and seek friends and can get outside of yourself and look to serve and love others. That's how you build friends. But the verse goes on to say this, but there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Amen. Who is that, church family? Jesus. Jesus. Jesus sticks closer than a brother. Quickly, number four. During times of loneliness, seek supplication. Lastly, verse 22. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Finishes up with a word of prayer. The Bible says in Philippians 4, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. David Livingston died in prayer. The great missionary on his knees beside his bed. He died the way he lived in the presence of God. Paul died the way he lived in the presence of God. We want to live and die the way Paul did in the presence of God. Now we know that loneliness is an experience and no one faced a greater case of loneliness than Jesus Himself. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 that Jesus was despised and rejected. 
He left his heavenly fame for an earthly frame to be identified with scoundrels like us, and we rejected him. The Bible says that when Jesus hung on the cross, the greatest loneliness, the greatest rejection he ever experienced, hanging on the cross, when he called out to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When Jesus hung on the cross, suspended between heaven and earth, heaven and earth, as if, as if he was being rejected by both heaven and earth. The most lonely anyone has ever been was Jesus hanging on the cross and He hung there and He died there and He experienced that so that we would not have to. So that we could have life and we could have eternal life and we could have abundant life because He took the punishment that we deserved. The loneliness that sin always creates to give us the help and the hope that we need through salvation, which is Him. Church family, let's pray together.